And you are just started recording. Julian, Julian, can I just check? Can you see my screen, by the way? Can you see the slide? Yes, we can. Okay, super. Okay, thanks. Thanks. Yeah, we can. That's very cool. And I noticed we've got Ross as well, right? We've got other Valero people. Correct. Ross is starting in from Australia. Yeah. He is. It's glass of wine time there. <laughs> yeah. Here it's coffee time. <laughs> Lots of coffee time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, here we're on our third coffee, fourth coffee. So, all right. So have you started recording? Yeah, all right. So I'll kick it off. Julian. So welcome everyone to um, this trade finance SIG. Um, we've got a, a special uh, today with, with Belair, it was very exciting. Uh, I've been asked to just read out the, um, our antitrust policy. As you know, we all have an antitrust policy. Uh, you can read this on our web if you want. I'll read it quickly. The Linux Foundation meetings involve participation by industry competitors and is the intention of the Linux Foundation to conduct all of its activities in accordance with applicable antitrust and competition laws. It is therefore extremely important the attendees adhere to meeting agendas and be aware and not participate in any activities that are prohibited under the applicable US state, federal or antitrust and competition laws. So if you want to learn more about that, please look up on our website and happy to provide more information. I'm now going to hand you to Andrea, who's going to uh, kick off our, our chair, who's going to kick off uh, the session today. Thank you. Welcome, Andrea. everybody. Yeah, I step in. Uh, and sorry for the audio. If it's not that good, I don't know what's going on. Uh, you know, it's my big pleasure to you have. Sound good, uh, actually. You sound good. It sounds good now. I don't know what's going on. It leaps sometimes. It's locked down. But something's going wrong. Anyway. It's my pleasure to have Yako today. I asked him to join us on a call. And even this, because I would like to, to go deeper into this subject, which is really important, and it's one of the major ones in trade finance. So today, we'll, uh, you know, we'll present a solutions devised by Bolero in terms of trade finance, and specifically on electronic bills of lading. So Yako, please step in, take the word. So this guy, so I am in the global uh, committee for the global trade finance. So the I think there was a tool coming in. Yeah, yeah, he, he stepped in. Yako, uh, yeah. I'll leave for your presentation. Sorry that, yeah, Yako, go. Uh, apologies for turning it late, but uh, go ahead. No worries, no worries. So I'm, I'm actually at the customer location, so apologies for that. Yeah. <laughs> That's okay. It's always good to be at customers, right? <laughs> yeah, and I did ask a customer, do they know Bolero? And, and uh, Anujji, do you know Bolero? Of course, of course. He knows Bolero, so that's, that's, mm. that's, that's where you go. Yeah. That's really we have to together. Uh, cheers. Right. Nice to hear. Cheers. cheers. Thank you. So, so thank you all for joining, and, and thanks to Julian, and thanks to Andrea for allowing me to, to, to do a presentation for you today. Um, what I will try and do today is not make it too um, uh, complex and try to come in high level. So what do we do from a Belair perspective? How do we link um, you know, the, the physical supply chain to the financial supply chain? How do we work with the traditional trade environments and the trade products? And how do we connect to, I would say, you know, the, the, the latest uh, initiatives out there in terms of, you know, blockchain technology and blockchain initiatives out there. And I'll come in from a very pragmatic perspective. There is room at the end for a QA. and a um, And I, I really, really, really ask you to please send in your questions or um, maybe we can open it up at the end so everybody can ask their questions uh, verbally because I, I know it is a, it can be a difficult topic, but I'll try and explain it as, as simple as I can. And, and I'm, I'm sure it will work out. So I have a few slides for you. Um, I think they will also be shared after the session. Um, so let me just go to the first slide. I have a small agenda for today. Um, introduction about myself, um, global trade, why things are changing and why do they have to change and how are we involved there? Um, then I'll go more into, you know, what we are doing there and how long we're already doing that um, in terms of, you know, um, uh, how we connect banks and corporates and how we also, you know, uh, enable electronic bills of lading and how these are used out there 
in, 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 in um, the business. And as I said, Q&A in, in the back. So just a, a few words about me. So you know, and who is this Dutch guy with the, with the gray hair uh, and what is he all about? So my background is in trade finance and commodity finance, uh, mainly from the banking side, but also from a factoring and a forfeiting perspective. Um, I've done everything under the sun, I would say over the last 35 years. Um, and I would say the last eight, nine years, I'm heavily focusing on digitization in trade. Um, that means that, amongst other things, I'm also part of the International Chamber of Commerce. I am working uh, in the steering committee for digital trade. And with it that I'm actually co-chairing a subgroup, which is around fintech adoption. Um, and that basically is around how can fintechs in the broad sense then uh, be best prepared when they start to engage into discussions with, for instance, banks, or from other financial institutions on you know, how to work together. What questions can you expect from a bank in terms of technology, security, uh, but even around your company? Um, so basically what we try to do with that stream is to make it easier for FinTechs to start working with these banks and these financial institutions out there, because you know, we all realize digitization and, and technology um, will play a much bigger role in trade going forward. Um, so that's me in a nutshell. I'm heading up the global sales force. Um, Ross is on the call today from Australia. We have a team in Hong Kong, in Singapore, in Austria, Europe, and in the UK. And I'm actually based in the Netherlands myself. Also, at any point after today, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out. You know, I'm always happy to explain and, and happy to help if possible. So that's about me. Um, so let's go into the presentation and, 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 and go through the slides and try to give you a bit more background on you know, what is this Bolero and what have we been doing and, and what is our, 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 our business area. So I'm sure you have seen pictures like this and I've, I've also seen last week you know, from Joel, you had a lot of information about collections and electronic collections. But basically this is the space where Bolero has been operating in for over 22 years. Um, we focus on, you know, what we call the physical supply chain, so the goods going from A to B around the globe, and to enable those shipments to take place, to be, you know, uh, that the, the, the goods can leave the port and the goods can be cleared at the other port when they come in through customs, uh, the port authorities, um, and, and all other things, you know, we focus on the documents around those physical supply chains, and we actually focus on having them in a digital format, in an electronic format. That's also what I'm going to talk a lot about, electronic bills of lading later today. Um, however, these documents are great and this data is great, but you need to use these for transactions, underlying transactions, which can, in our case, range from anything from open account payments, means you know just a buyer and a seller doing a transaction over the platform and, and using these electronic documents um, for instance, the, 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 the seller to claim the payment with the buyer and the buyer using these documents electronically to, you know, receive the goods, uh, you know, by handing over the documents to the local agent or the local uh, carrier. So that's on these documents, but these documents can also be used on, for instance, under bank transactions. Um, I'm sure you've heard about products like, you know, letters of credit. Um, again, Joel spoke about documentary collections. Um, there are more transactions out there that can be done uh, by banks or even by other parties. And by other parties, I mean all these initiatives that have popped up and have matured, like, for instance, Contour, and all these new initiatives out there to which we connect as well. I'll come to that later in the presentation as well. So basically, you can use these documents and the data of these documents to trigger traditional trade products, open account transactions, but also blockchain transactions. For us, by the way, it doesn't really matter if our electronic documents are used under, you know, um, a blockchain transactions on Corda or Hyperledger or Ethereum. Uh, we, we connect to any, um, but I just want to make uh, clear from the start, we are not on the blockchain ourselves. We still have traditional technology and traditional ways of exchanging these documents safely. 
Um, although, of course, you know, we also use security and we hash documents already for 22 years, for instance. So, but this is the, the area in which we operate. And actually, um, one of our core components is, of course, this electronic document, this electronic transport document, which is called a bill of lading. And actually, the name Bolero stands for Bill of Lading Electronic Registry Organization. So, so much about, you know, where we are, what we have been doing for 22 years. Um, what we also do is we connect all the parties in this environment. So we connect corporates to corporates, corporates to banks, uh, banks to other banks. We connect, for instance, also insurance companies, what have you, that's on the platform. I'll come to that later in the presentation as well. So digitization, it, it can deliver a clear advantage. There are many advantages for going digital in trade. And let me touch upon a few um, why um, they can be interesting from, from various angles. So if I, I look at this screen and I start on the left-hand side and I look at cash management, um, man, we talk to exporters. Why do they want to move away from paper? Why do they want to go digital with their documents? Basically, a big driver for them is actually speeding things up um, in terms of you know getting paid, for instance, uh, whether it's a site transaction, uh, they can present the documents more quickly to the buyer or even to the bank. Um, and if it's a deferred payment, they can ask for financing much more quickly because they will get the document and the data much more quickly from the shipping company, from the carrier, and they can present it much more quickly to whomever they want to get the money from. Um, as said, if it's a deferred payment, they can also ask for financing much quick, more quickly as well. Um, additional benefit in the trade world is that usually you have to make sure that these documents are correct, that there are no discrepancies. Um, when you start to use electronic documents, you will also reduce the risk of discrepancies. Um, not only when you create those documents, but only should you have made a mistake, it's much more easy to quickly return a set of documents back to the presenter and say, you know, you have to change things because you made a mistake than it is to do with paper documents. So again, there are additional benefits as well. If I look at the, 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 the almost the center of this slide, you see minimizing risks. Um, paper is much more open to fraud than, especially in our case, you know, digital documents and, and, and having uh, handling data in a secured way. Um, we have seen a lot of things happening in the, in the exactly in, in the commodity finance space recently where fraud was committed. When you start to work with digital documents and, 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 and a secure platform like Bolero, you massively reduce the risk for fraud. Um, just to give you one example, um, these bills of lading, and again, I will explain later how it works in detail, um, are not only just transport documents, but they also have a function which is called, you know, that they can give title. You can have actually um, uh, some power over the underlying goods. So often these documents are, for instance, used as collateral for financing. And you know, from a Bolero perspective, if you are pledging such a document to a uh, to a lender, um, that lender knows that they are the sole pledgee holder. And they know that they are the single holder of that pledge. So it cannot also be pledged to someone else. So that risk minimizes, for instance, the risk for a for a lender. But there are other ways why it can be much easier. And of course, also with this whole COVID nineteen crisis, um, you know, everybody is working from home. Or fortunately, some people are going back to the office now. But you know, the disruption was really, really, really big when paper suddenly got stuck around the globe. Um, documents not, you know, reaching the buyer from the, the shipping company or not from the buyer from or from the seller, I mean, or from the between the banks. Um, it was really a nightmare. So also with electronic documents, you can minimize risks of documents getting delayed or lost or what have you. On the right hand side, you see um, operational efficiencies. Now, that's also a very interesting part. Let me focus here on the buyer side, for instance. Um, when you see that a buyer is receiving goods, um, usually to, to pick up those goods in the port, uh, they will need the documents and they will need especially the, the bill of lading, or in our case, the electronic bill of lading. If they don't have those documents at the time that the vessel arrives or the goods need to be picked up, they will incur a lot of costs. Uh, 
um, which can be you know demerge costs related to the carrier, but it can also be cost for you know um, asking the bank for a for a shipping guarantee because you know the documents are not there and they still want to pick up the goods, um, or they have to ask the carrier for a telex release, um, or they have to have different processes in place with LOIs and what have you. So. You know, not having the documents arrive on time at the at the buyer side also confronts them with a lot of um, um, problems. Basically, these can all be solved with you know using electronic documents and using uh, um, you know a platform like Bolero. So it makes clear advantages. However, let's be honest. You know, in the last 22 years, digitization hasn't really really massively taken off in trade. Um, from an ICC perspective, you know, a lot of work has gone into, you know, updating the rules and making special conditions for electronic documents to be used under collections, again, to Joel's point, or under uh, letters of credit. Um, but still, the market and the business is very traditional, very paper-based and reluctant to change. So it is very important that these benefits are clear but it's also important that you know the authorities the ports the customs the banks um, the whole ecosystem is open to move away from paper because before you can do any smart contract whether it's on blockchain or whether it's on any other technology you have to move away from paper these transactions should not be used with paper okay so how does it work from a Bolero perspective? So as said, you know, we've been doing this for 22 years now. Um, we are connecting parties over, you know, um, uh, our network. And basically this means this parties that you're seeing here, um, seamlessly we enable corporates to connect for instance to their banks to apply for letters of credit or for bank guarantees or standby LCs but if they're on the exporting side they can receive those transactions as being the beneficiary um, you know and especially for large uh, corporates they deal with multiple banks and they don't want to use all these bank portals and they can just use the Bolero portal to reach all these banks um, it's interoperable. Um, the legal framework, I'm going to come to that in, uh, in the next slide because that is really important. And I'll also come in from, you know, how that is important for, you know, even the, 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 the most high tech solutions out there. And of course, a network of network. We connect, we connect to anybody that makes sense from a trade finance perspective, whether it's banks on traditional products, whether it's initiatives like, you know, DLT ledgers, Comchain, Contour, uh, Envoy, um, and many more in the, in the blockchain space. Um, as said, whether it's Corda, Hyperledger, Ethereum, it doesn't matter to us as long as there is a need for transport data, transport documents, um, smart contracts to be triggered with um, documents that actually focus on the physical supply chain. So from that perspective, network of networks, but we also connect to whomever we need. Now, on the next slide, let's now talk more about what we do and, and, and why the platform is so important. And again, the platform can connect to anything, um, but also within the platform, there are a few key components um, which I will address. And hopefully that will make clear for why um, Bolero is not just about technology, but it is also about, you know, trust. It's also about legal infrastructures and, you know, it's also about the title registry. So as said in the beginning, you know, we enable these electronic documents to be created. We enable them to be exchanged and we enable them to be used over the platform. Now for electronic documents to work, a legal infrastructure is key. All parties handling these electronic documents must agree to how things are being done and what is the legal status, what is the validity, and how can you use these electronic documents. Now, let me give you a very simple example. I'm not, I'm not sure if anybody can see also my, 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 my video here, but um, I'm actually based in the Netherlands. And let me just give you a very simple example. You know, um, here in the Netherlands, we have the euro as a currency. Now, I have here a 20 euro banknote, right? Um, if I were to take my iPhone here and I would make a picture of this 20 euro banknote, and I would um, 
turn it into a PDF. I would digitally sign it. I would hash it. I would encrypt it. I would um, make it available securely over the Bolero network to any of you attending this session today. Um, and you would receive it. Have I really given you 20 euros at that moment? Not really. I've, I've given you an image of a 20 euro note. I still have the original here in Amsterdam. I can still spend it. And, and you have a, in a very secure way, maybe even a structured data way, you have an image of a 20 euro banknote, but you can't really use it. Now, you can imagine from a Bolero platform, um, if you have an electronic bill of lading, um, which is a contract of carriage, which is a title document, as I said, which is a negotiable document, as I said, you need to be sure that it can be used, that it has value. Now, for me as a person here to turn this into you know, digital currency right now, for instance, I would have to go to my bank. I have to deposit it into my account and then I can electronically transfer 20 euros to you. Um, in our scenario, for an electronic bill of lading to be really working and to be really be able to be exchanged between parties, we have what's so called the legal framework, which we call the rule book. So that means that all parties involved in the use of an electronic bill of lading have agreed to the Bolero rule book, have agreed to the Bolero legal infrastructure. So that means if a carrier like a CMA or an Evergreen or a Maersk, if they create an electronic bill of lading over the Bolero platform and make it available, for instance, to the exporter, it is a real electronic bill of lading. Um, it is a contract of carriage. It actually, if you look at you know, the PDF version of it, it looks exactly the same as a paper bill of lading, but it also has the same functionalities. You can endorse it. You can hand it over to a bank as collateral for financing. Everything you can do with a paper bill of lading, you can do with an electronic bill of lading. So what I try to say here, it's not about you know, the data. It's not just about the image. It's not about the secure transfer of a file or you know, hashing it, what we do as well, we fingerprint it. Uh, but it's also, you need to have the legal infrastructure and uh, to support it to make sure that it can actually be used as it is intended to use. Um, the next thing on the center there, on the bottom, what you will see is the title registry. Um, again, coming back to the banknote, if I have a paper banknote and I would hand it off to Andrea, for instance, uh, and I put it in his hands, let's say we're in the same room, um, it's clear that Andrea is now holding the 20 uh, euro banknote. Uh, in an electronic scenario uh, or a digital scenario, you also want to make sure that if you know the document passes from one party to another party, that it is absolutely clear who is holding the original at any given point. Um, from a Bolero perspective, to, to control that transfer or handover of documents or giving title or endorsing, all of that is registered in what we call the title registry. So that's a function within Bolero, which at any given point is absolutely certain of, for instance, who is holding the original electronic document. Um, if you compare it to, to, to blockchain language, um, it would be a notary function. So basically we act as a notary where we are always 100% um, sure who is holding the original document when. Um, Again, a very important feature and a feature why, uh, you know, even the blockchain initiatives come to us, you know, because as said, you need a legal infrastructure. As said, you need a title registry and, and we support that. Um, I'll talk more about bill of lading in a second, how it actually looks and works, but you know, this is just to set the, 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 the outline for, you know, how and why it works and why you need more than just data or you just need more than a, a a, 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 a smart contract or what have you. Um, of course, the platform needs to be secure. Uh, we connect all these parties. We also have data matching elements in there as well. Um, and of course, these documents are flying over it. On the right-hand side, you see the network, which is another representation of what I explained earlier. And on the left-hand side, you see um, uh, just as a, as a sample, some of the things we offer, um, I'll go to each of them, um, some a bit longer, some a bit smaller, but basically we offer a lot of applications which can be used um, either uh, via our web interface 
or which can be used also from an API uh, connectivity if we linking, for instance, to other platforms or other uh, solutions out there. And those are in the areas of letters of credit guarantees, um, e-presentations, which can also be in relation to collections, for instance. Um, we do have a supply chain solution, supply chain finance solution, which, for instance, one major bank has been using that already for a long time to automate supply chain finance. They have supply chain finance program uh, where, you know, data from a purchase order is matched against data from the actual invoice and, a, um, and shipment data. And then if the seller would like to receive financing, that whole um, uh, process is matched automatically and managed automatically. And that's why we provide, you know, the, the data matching, as you see on the, on the right, on the middle, on the, on the platform side. And of course, electronic bills of lading. So in terms of using this, so what we notice is we have two type of main users. So we have main users that use um, the, the, the web interface. Um, we are now rolling out our new web interface for our clients to use Bolero as said with their banks, with their carriers or using electronic documents or what have you. Um, the name of the new technology platform or the new, the new user experience is called Galileo. Um, it's extremely intuitive. Um, we have, you know, rolled this out. We've been, as said, you know, over 20 years in this business. And I can tell you in 20 years, you get a lot of client feedback um, uh, from, you know, all these, all these different areas. And we've incorporated all that feedback to make sure that, you know, the user experience is up to date. Um, but also in the background, we've ensured that, you know, since connectivity is key these days, that the Galileo platform and the Bolero proposition can easily integrate with you know, any other solution out there, whether it's ERP systems as clients, whether it's back office systems as banks, or whether it's blockchain initiatives out there. Um, and that can be done by simple API calls and protocols. That is um, how we operate um, from focus on this session today one of the services we provide is ebl as a service electronic bill of lading as a service so any um, uh, smart contract um, initiative out there that would like to you know connect to bolero to enable the use of electronic bills of lading um, to either trigger the smart contract or to be part of the, the conditions of a smart contract we can enable that in the background um, so we also sometimes see that the actual users of the transactions are using um, third-party applications. And then we are just in the background there to facilitate and act as the pipe, for instance, between the shipping company and, and the initiative, um, like for instance, to the sellers and the buyers and, and, and the solutions out there. So that's basically from a technology perspective, we are very agnostic and, and we are very flexible to connect whomever we need to connect to. Um, yeah, I won't go through this too much. Um, so basically, um, letters of credit, that's, uh, you know, where the clients and the banks can communicate on and they can utilize them. Uh, I'm, I'm going to switch to to the bills of lading because I think that's most relevant for the audience today. Um, of course, guarantees can be handled over the platform. And then when I say guarantees, I mean bank guarantees, but I also mean um, uh, standby letters of credit. Um, you know, we have customers that do thousands and thousands of these transactions over our platform with multiple banks. And of course, when you look at two um, multiple banks, we have uh, over 70 banking groups globally connected to, uh, to Bolero. Um, big names, small names, and even when you see a big name, um, it doesn't mean just one location, but it means often, you know, globally. So we have a big reach out there for all these clients. Um, and of course, the corporates, right? In the end, everything we do, and I think this is true for any initiative out there, it's all about the corporates. It's all about the customers. Um, you do everything for the customers to either make their life easier or to enable financing for them or to enable things to go faster, uh, less risky. That is what we do. And that's what we are in this business already for so long. Um, if you forget about, you know, what's in it for the clients, what's in it for the corporates, then you might as well close shop. That's the most important thing. So, um, of course, to be able to be an electronic bill of lading provider, an EBL provider, um, you are nowhere if you don't have the network, if you don't have the network with the carriers. 
uh, carriers are the shipping companies, you know, these vessel operators. Um, we have over 200, actually we have around 230, I think the latest count is. And we have major carriers, um, uh, like for instance, you see here names like Evergreen and CMA, um, with whom we are fully integrated into the back office environment. So if, if you would go to these carriers and, and you would look up, you know, e-bills of lading on their websites, um, you will probably not find the name Bolero there, but we are actually there in the background um, facilitating, you know, the, 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 the electronic bill of lading. And of course, our legal infrastructure is also the basis thereof. And also the, the platform is also in the background to exchange these documents and this data securely. So there you won't see us prominently, but we are there in the background. But for, even for a small carrier that maybe does a few shipments, we also have a web user interface and they can also get going with us. So for us, it doesn't really matter. Uh, again, it is the corporates who are in the driving seat. If a corporate for a, for instance, for a short shipping route, doesn't want to take the risk of, you know, these paper documents taking too long to go from A to B, um, wants to use electronic bills of lading, you know, they typically come to us and together with them, we do our utmost to make that work for, for in this case, for instance, a short shipping route. Uh, we were the first. Um, there are more initiatives out there. There's competition out there. Um, we also see a lot of uh, very new initiatives out there. Um, the underlying technology, honestly, um, I think it's irrelevant. Um, and I maybe, you know, I know, I know I'm talking to the hyperledger community now. So, but I think the underlying technology is irrelevant. It is about, you know, what does it solve? What does it do? Does it work? Is there adoption? Does it make sense? And, and, and do you have the proper infrastructure to make it work in all these countries and, and you know, that people are comfortable with it? Um, technology, uh, if you talk to the corporates, you know, they couldn't care less about the technology, whether to put it very black and white, if it's an Excel sheet or if it's you know, a, a, a hyperledger solution, as long as it relieves them from issues, pain, problems, uh, speed things up, gets, you know, then they're open to it. So uh, I'm also in our perspective, you know, our technology, you know, we're, we're, we're web-based, it's software as a service, uh, but I hardly talk about the technology when I talk to our corporates and our banks and all our other clients around the globe. It is more about, you know, what does it do and how does it help me in my day-to-day -day business? Um, but as said, we were the first, we, we, we still like to think ourselves of the Coca-Cola of the electronic bill of lading. There are more initiatives out there. And honestly, I only welcome that because, you know, um, there, there is so much ground to cover globally. And, um, you know, the, 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 the more the merrier from that perspective. Now, let me go more into, you know, electronic bills of lading. Um, what is it and, and, and how does it work and, and why does it work? So, um, let me explain for those of you who are a bit unaware maybe of what a bill of lading is, uh, what it is and how, it, how a paper one is different from an electronic bill of lading. So a bill of lading in essence basically is a contract of carriage um, to you know, enable a, a set of goods to be shipped from A to B. Um, the, the, the shipper, the exporter will then receive this document from the shipping company and basically it will has a few functions. So it's a contract of carriage. It also is a negotiable document if it's issued like that, which means that it can be used to, to be transferred to another party. Um, it is also a title document. So that means it gives control of the goods. And that's why I said, you know, sometimes banks love to get a bill of lading from a client if they're financing, because then if the loan is not replayed, they have somewhat control by having the bill of lading and then they can, you know, exercise their right on the pledge and try to recover the loss, for instance, from selling the goods. Um, and it's a document that is being used, you know, widely, I, I would say for hundreds and hundreds of years all around the globe. So it's a very important document in trade. I would say it's, it's uh, for ocean going uh, shipments, it's the most important document out there and it's widely used. So what's the difference between a paper bill of lading and an electronic bill of lading? A few things, first of all, of course, stating the obvious, it's electronic instead of paper. Um, for it to work, you need this legal infrastructure. For it to work, you need to have a way to exchange them securely and have that tracked in a title registry. That's what Bolero is all about. 
Um, but also, if you look at the bill of lading um, over uh, Bolero, you will see a few differences. The first difference, what you will see is normally a paper bill of lading is issued in three original and a few non-negotiable copies. The reason for that is, again, very old fashioned. Um, you know, usually in the old days, one original used to travel in captain's mail, you know, with the, 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 the captain of the vessel. He would have one copy. Um, the, the client would present these other two copies, usually to a bank, for instance, under a letter of credit. And the bank would send those documents in two separate mails to the other bank uh, of the buyer and, and, you know, hoping at least one of them would make it to the end uh, and for, the, for the transaction to be used. Um, in in, when you're looking at an electronic bill of lading, there's always just one original because it doesn't get lost. It doesn't get delayed. So why have three copies? It doesn't make sense. So this is one original. That's the first big difference. The second big difference is if you look at a paper bill of lading, you will see that people have signed it with a wet signature. Um, of course, in a digital environment, it doesn't make sense to have an image of a, of a signature. Uh, you need to have a digital signature. From a Bolero perspective, again, the legal infrastructure, the rule book covers the digital signature. Another question I always get, yeah, is that digital signature, is that in line with my local regulations in my country? Um, and I can tell you often it probably is not the case, but because all the parties acting over Bolero have agreed to the legal infrastructure, which is based on English law, um, then if all parties agree to the rule of the game, it can work all around the globe, regardless of any local deviations or what have you. So the digital signature represented by words, if you look at it uh, on the image, is covered by the legal infrastructure by the Bolero rulebook. Um, the last main difference is that normally if you would endorse a bill of lading, so I would say, you know, this bill of lading is mine, but I'm now going to endorse it to Andrea in a paper scenario, I would put a stamp on it and I would say, you know, for me, uh, and now to the order of Andrea, in case of an electronic bill of lading, that is done by updating this title registry, this notary function. Um, again, so you won't see an, an, an image of an, a stamp, for instance, if you look at the PDF file, uh, which is official representation of the electronic bill of lading. Other than that, an electronic bill of lading looks exactly the same. So clients, if they see an electronic bill of lading, they'll immediately recognize and understand it. Um, it has the same front, the same back, the same colors, because of course it's issued by the exact same carrier that would issue a paper bill of lading. So hopefully in a nutshell, this explains why a bill of lading is, uh, what is different between an electronic bill of lading and paper bill of lading, but actually the usage thereof is exactly the same as a paper bill of lading. From a smart contract perspective and from, an, uh, from a data exchange perspective, of course, there is also data behind it. Um, some carriers provide you know, the raw data in an XML format to us. Uh, some only provide metadata at a, at a higher level. But of course, these documents can be used in connection to smart contracts, uh, for instance, as proof of uh, performance, or, for instance, we can uh, go as far as having a conditional release of these documents by saying, if a smart contract has been triggered correctly, Bolero will automatically release the documents from the seller to the buyer, so the buyer can take these documents and actually take possession of the goods. Um, that's also a very interesting element. We're now doing that, for instance, with the Marco Polo project, again, a blockchain initiative, where you know it's one thing to trigger a smart contract, but the buyer and the seller would need, still need to exchange you know, the documents or the, 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 the title, for instance, in the background so that the other party can pick up the goods and clear them through customs, for instance. So that's where you know, uh, we, we introduce the element of a conditional release, uh, whereby we act as a, yeah, call it an escrow or, or a, a secure party that will then enable these documents to be automatically um, uh, exchanged between the parties once, for instance, a smart contract has been triggered positively. I'm just checking for time. Okay, I, I do want to leave some room for questions, so I'll, I'll, I'll go towards wrapping it up now. Um, so what are electronic presentations? Um, electronic presentations basically means that our clients, again, I'm not going to repeat them all, use these electronic documents 
um, under transactions, anything from open account to traditional trade products, also like the collections that Joel was speaking about, but also blockchain transactions, for instance, like the, 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 the electronic LCs over, over Contour, for instance. For those things to be able to happen, it's not just the fact that you need electronic documents or data, you would also need those transactions to be enabled to use electronic documents. Um, in case of traditional letters of credit, for instance, um, they are usually used with paper documents. If you want to start using electronic documents under traditional letters of credit, which is perfectly possible, um, then for instance, you have to change the the, 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 the rules or you have to change, you don't have to change the rules. You have to mention that other rules apply. And in case of a letter of credit, it would be normally the UCP 600. Um, but if you start to use electronic documents, you would have to say that the letters of credit is subject to the EUCP, the electronic uh, uh, rules for you know, handling letters of credit. Um, the same goes for if you want to start using electronic documents under collections, um, you would have to say that that collection is subject to the EURC. So those are the electronic rules or the rules for electronic transactions for documentary collections. Again, these are all ICC publications. Um, um, especially the EUCP and the EURC are available free of charge to download. If you go to icc.org website, you can download them for free and then you can see what those, those E uh, rules entail. Uh, but basically you would have to make sure that those uh, transactions are, are subject to those rules uh, for it to work. Um, also, of course, in those transactions, you need to make sure that uh, the conditions are in line with using electronic documents. So you should no longer say that documents have to be presented at the counter of a bank at a certain date, uh, because now you would have to say that these documents have to be presented over the Bolero platform at a certain date. And of course, you would have to make sure that um, the documents that are prescribed are no longer you know, paper documents, like three thirds original of a bill of lading, but of course, electronic documents. And that's where we help our clients with templates, with guidance, um, often with hand-holding through the first transactions, because it's not easy to, 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 to think or rethink the way you have been doing uh, your transactions for, for decades, I would say, and start using electronic documents or, or you know, uh, even those, 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 those uh, smart contracts. And basically, so the, what you would need is then a platform like Bolero to do that. And this is not a sales pitch. I'm just trying here to explain how we work. So final slide. And again, it's, it's, it's uh, in the deck that you will be receiving after today. Um, going digital, whether it's, you know, just going paperless or whether it's, you know, moving to, to smart contracts or, or ELCs or, or e-collections, um, there are benefits in it for all parties. Um, here you have the highlights from the seller's perspective, from the buyer's perspective, from financial institutions and from carriers. Um, but it is not that, you know, here is the solution, have a go, good luck. Um, you also need to be able to help these customers on the journey. I often say that, you know, in, 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 in trade finance, digitization is, 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 is not a revolution, it's an evolution. It is unfortunately a slow process, also because there are so many parties involved. If only it was just a buyer and a seller, um, but you have customs regulations, you have shippers, uh, you have the, the carriers, you have the customs. There are so many parties involved, which um, um, doesn't always make it easy. Um, but if you come in from a business angle, you know, um, uh, you will succeed. So having said this and knowing we have, uh, I would say a little over 10 minutes left in the session, I would love to open it up uh, for questions. So Andrea, I'm not sure how you wanna go about the questions, if you would like to have the questions in the chat or if, if we open, the, open up the sound for people to ask questions. There are a few questions that were, you know, given to me on the chat. Uh, first of all, you know, uh, Jaco, we're talking about e-bills of lading, but, you know, being both of us trade finance practitioners, what about the rest of the documents which are usually required to be presented under normal collections or an LC? You know, that often LCs calls for instance, insurance certificates or policies. They yeah. call for 
certificates of origins. Uh, what is the status in digitization in terms of these documents? Very good question. So um, let me come in from two angles there. So first of all, um, to trigger trade transactions, like for instance, a letter of credit, a letter of credit can be payable against almost anything. So a letter of credit can be payable against an unsigned invoice alone, if you want to. Um, of course, that is very minimal. Um, so in practice, you see that, you know, a lot of documents are uh, prescribed to be presented under a letter of credit. Um, it isn't necessary, but this is what happens. So what we see with our customers, what they do under the letters of credit, they, for instance, you know, they, they will, of, of course, always prescribe, you know, uh, an invoice and packing list and wait list, what have you. They will prescribe an electronic bill of lading, uh, of course, you know, as, 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 as the transport document. Other supporting documents, what we see is that sometimes under the LCs, copies of these documents are presented under the LC. So for instance, a copy of the certificate of origin or a copy of the phytosanitary certificate. Um, reason being that there are currently, uh, I would say, no global standards yet on these other supporting documents. However, 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 um, we are very closely involved in those initiatives where it comes to electronic certificates of origin or where it comes to electronic phytosanitary certificates. That's a certificate mostly used in, 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 in Agri. Um, and we are working closely with, uh, for instance, the, 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 the Grain Council on that one as well. So, so there are things happening in that space, um, but it is still early days for all documents to be truly digital and globally accepted. So sometimes what we see, and that's also why I say it's an evolution, not a revolution, to enable these transactions, and, and I mean the underlying shipments to be affected globally, sometimes some documents in a paper format have to travel directly between the seller and the buyer. Um, unfortunately, that is still the case for some jurisdictions or some countries. However, to trigger these trade transactions, you know, um, that can be done fully digital. So it's a split. Fortunately, uh, maybe I can elaborate a bit more, is what we see out there now is that, and again, COVID-19 has been a big push there as well, is that governments uh, are opening up much more now to digitization. Just to give you one example, Peru uh, in South America has said, you know, within a few months for any import or export going into and out of Peru, um, electronic documents should be the norm and paper documents should be the exception. So we see that things are happening, but honestly, it is a transition. It is a transition. The world is not digital yet, totally when it comes to trade finance. Absolutely. You know, uh, uh, you know what my thoughts are because we, we often saw, except the Yako, uh, I agree with you, it's a slow one, uh, but it will happen. You know, basically it's just a starter. COVID-19 just gave very spark to it. I, definitely, and, and what I can tell you without mentioning the name, you know, one of our carriers um, um, between the month of March and April of this year, uh, we saw a, uh, uh, an increase of volumes of electronic bills of lading issued by the factor of four, it quadrupled. Um, so we saw that, you know, the, 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 the companies, so I mean uh, exporters and importers, moved to electronic bills of lading. We didn't see that exact same spike on the banking side. So that means that the banks are moving less quickly uh, or are less flexible, maybe I should put it like that, to, to quickly move to doing more e-presentations and handling electronic documents. So corporates are very quick to uh, uh, adjust and apply. And that also comes back to my statement at the beginning. It has to make sense to the corporates. So why did they quickly jump and why did these numbers quadruple in, 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 in April compared to March? It's because the paper documents got stuck at that time and they thought, ooh, you know, these, these, these carriers over Bolero can offer these electronic bills of lading. Okay, let's use that because we want the trade to continue. Uh, absolutely. What I noticed is banks are very slow in reacting. Maybe they had investments in legacy systems. I don't know why, but Really, they are stuck on traditions and stuck on paper, of course. There are two yeah. more questions for you. Um, one is related to the um, 
the bills of lading, of course, both of them actually. Um, first thing is what about the endorsement? You know, bills of lading shall be often endorsed, whether you're under a collection or under an LC. Yep. They have to be endorsed sooner or later. How this this happen in an environment in an electronic environment? How this <laughs> Very good question. So the endorsement is a, a very normal feature indeed for paper bills of lading, and it's also a very normal feature for the Bolero electronic bills of lading. So the endorsements are being handled and registered in this title registry, what I mentioned. So the title registry, once I would endorse the bill of lading to you, Andrea, the title registry is actually um, updated with this endorsement. And now it is very clear that um, I have endorsed this bill of lading to you. If you would then endorse it to the next party and to the next party, to the next party, each time the title registry is updated, there's an audit trail of that. Um, and basically it mirrors the paper process. If you endorse a paper bill of lading three, four, five, six, seven times, you will see a string of stamps and, and signatures. Um, in, in a Bolero environment, um, you will not see those stamps and signatures. Actually, in the title registry, you will see the endorsement tra uh, 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 trail, and you will also see who is the, latest, the latest party to whom the bill of lading has been endorsed. Basically, an electronic bill of lading, anything you can do with a paper bill of lading, you can do with a um, um, uh, an electronic bill of lading. Maybe, if, if you permit me, I would also like to explain uh, very quickly that sometimes the chain breaks. So sometimes, let's say, Andrea, you want to uh, to endorse the bill of lading to Julian for whatever reason, and Julian is not on Bolero, uh, or for whatever reason, you know, doesn't want to receive an electronic bill of lading. Um, then you, Andrea, as being the last holder of this electronic bill of lading, you can request the shipping company, the carrier, to um, replace the electronic bill of lading with a paper bill of lading that actually mirrors and replaces the electronic bill of lading. So if Julian, for whatever reason, needs a paper document, he will then have three-thirds original bill of lading, which he can use, for instance, to clear the goods locally. Because in reality, sometimes the chain breaks and we have a mechanism for when, if the chain breaks, that you can always go back to paper. It's not that you print it off yourself. No, you have to request the carrier to provide you with a paper bill of lading to replace the digital bill of lading. Um, and that is also covered by the legal infrastructure. It's covered by the rule book. And we see that, for instance, a lot in, in, in China, where sometimes you know the final buyer is not known until last minute or for any other reason. So we also have a mechanism to act and to handle if the chain breaks at some point, which I can tell you happens in reality. Absolutely so, Joe, um, Jaco. Just one more question from our friend Joel. Uh, is, I re go reading, with the increasing number of e-bills e e of lading providers, how do you see the e-bill of lading landscape evolve? If each e-bill of lading platform manages its own digital original document, each with their own notary function, how do these e-bill of lading documents become possible across different platforms? Very Should good, very good question. Very good question. Of course, you know, be, being the first 22 years ago, that 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 problem, if I may say, did not exist because we were the only ones. And over time, you know, other players have come into the market. And, and I said, you know, I welcome that because um, uh, I, I often call it a blue ocean to stay in the shipping terms. There's there's so much to do. Um, of course, right now on the paper bill of lading, of course, you know, you have the same issue, right? If a paper bill of lading is issued by one carrier, the other carrier can't really do a lot with it. Um, but what is happening right now in the background, which I think is very good, is that all these parties are now talking to each other. So right now, again, this is a driver from the ICC. There is the Digital Standards Initiative, the DSI, um, where we are talking together with these other providers. Okay, can how can we think about interoperability? How can we look into maybe you know uh, 
either synchronizing or connecting the, 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 the legal infrastructure, the rule books and stuff. So those things are happening. We are very actively participating in that as well. Um, so I think over time there will be interoperability. Um, I don't think that there will be just one winner and that everybody will turn to that party. No, um, uh, for whatever reason, you know, people will always select one or the other. Um, but I think definitely the DSI, the Digital Standards Initiative now from ICC, um, uh, I think one of the first sessions actually happened this week. Um, and interoperability is a key topic uh, that's going to be discussed and addressed there. Absolutely, Jaco. This is a very important question, uh, and I was planning to ask you too. I mean, from my side, <laughs> what is the possibility if we have in some ways to compete with what is happening or to, uh, let's say, reproduce what goes on in the material world and physical world? Interoperability is absolutely one thing that has to be fixed, and possibility as well. You know, how things work in the real world from bank from corporate to the bank and to the other bank in the importing country that should be fixed absolutely 100 percent correct andrea yeah any other questions from the attendance uh gentlemen julian or ross as well No, I don't think I think we're coming very much to the end here now anyway, right? That was yep. a great presentation. Um, thank you very much. One question I may add is you, you, you said that you're working with some of the uh, the blockchain. Obviously, we're this is about blockchain here. Um, but I, I assume you're working with I know you're working with a number of platforms. Um, how, how do you how do you interact with uh, with uh, with the blockchain like the we dot trades, the DLT ledger? Yeah. How, how do you interact with them? Yeah, very, very good question, Julian. So basically what we do there is we, we, we enable the use of these electronic bills of lading under these transactions. So just, just to give you one example, uh, maybe Contour is a nice one, um, where um, the, the, the exporter can then pick up the Bolero electronic bill of lading and make that available for instance to the negotiating bank. Um, they don't access the Bolero platform, they meaning the, the exporter, they meaning the bank. Um, we are just a pipe in the background, enabling the electronic bill of lading to be used and the, enabling the, the, the legal infrastructure to be used, enable the title registry to be used. And um, basically by means of you know, API connectivity, those documents can be used under these transactions. For Marco Polo, for instance, we go one step further. That's when I talk about you know, this conditional release where not only we enable the use of these electronic bills of lading uh, under these transactions, but also we act as sort of an escrow where, you know, if we hear back from Marco Polo that the, 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 the Marco Polo transaction has matched, that, you know, the, the, everything is in order, we will automatically transfer the documents, you know, to the buyer. And of course they need those documents. So thereby reducing the concern of the buyer that, hey, my smart contract is triggered. So probably I will get be debited but you know, how do I get my hands on the documents that I need to, 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 to you know, obtain the goods from the, from the, from the port? So um, from our perspective, it's basically, that's why I mentioned with you know, EBL as a service, electronic bills of lane as a service, that's how we connect to these, these various initiatives. And it depends on what the nature of the initiative is. Is it, is it a finance platform? Then we enable, for instance, the function where you know, the, the bill of lading can be pledged to a lender, for instance, as security for financing. So, it, it depends on the nature of the of the initiative, uh, how we actually interact. But it's 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 done by API connectivity. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Really excellent one, uh, Jaco. Yeah. Presentation. I'm so glad to have you here. Hopefully, we'll have the chance to hear from you again in the future, as we agreed upon. So stay tuned, guys, and we'll have more insights from Yako and Bolero in the future. And thanks to everybody for attending. We'll see you in two weeks' time. We're going to have one more very interesting presentation. Okay. It's all. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you. Bye, Yako. Bye, Julian. Have a nice Bye. day. Bye.